For a long time, the neighborhood was referred to as South Brooklyn or Red Hook. A lot of people called it Red Hook. But here we had Brownstone, Brooklyn Heights, and Cobble Hill and Carroll Gardens. This was South Brooklyn. I was born and raised here at 102 First Place, the next building to the building we're in right now. This is 104. I was born and raised in 102, one flight up. Up the stairs we go. You want this to everybody? Yes, all these four buildings. Come on in. You find pictures all over the place. My sister collects them, I think. Oh, this one of my mother is a classic. You're going to love this. 16 years old. Damn few ladies in those years were driving cars. Let me tell you, my mother, the first one to get an undertaker's license, first one to drive a car as well. My father and his brothers immigrated from Italy here around 1909. In those days, this was an overwhelmingly poor Italian ghetto neighborhood. They decided to go into the importing of Italian wines for this burgeoning Italian ghetto neighborhood, doing famously well. But then prohibition is declared and all of a sudden they're out of business. But they decided to go into this brand new business, movies, silent movies. And that's the business I grew up with. I was a pretty popular kid. If you knew me, you can get into the movies for free. A short time later, Mr. Moralia came to my father and said, Patsy, you be my partner. I'm an undertaker. I'll do all the undertaking work. You bring in the business because everybody knows you. We'll call it Scotto Funeral Home. You don't have to do a thing other than collect 50%. My father said, what have I got to lose? Okay, we're in the funeral business. But then the Korean War broke out. Holy smoke. It was insane. I couldn't believe anybody could survive what we were going through at the time. It was a whole other world for me. They really made an officer and a gentleman out of me as far as I was concerned. And that's me and my sister. That's me. We were not aware of it at the time, but the flight to the suburbs was happening. As you moved up the economic social educational ladder, you left the neighborhood. This was a poor neighborhood. I said, my God, why do we have to leave the neighborhood? Come on, come on down. We got to cover ground. Here we go. Okay, this way. People started listening to us when I was saying, for God's sakes, don't you have any pride in your neighborhood? Hello, oh, don't go by without saying hello. If we were going to improve the neighborhood and convince people that they didn't have to flee to the suburbs, that they could stay here in the neighborhood, we were going to fight for the neighborhood and for them. Tomorrow. Tomorrow. Look out, here I come. We got a beautiful neighborhood here and we got to make it better all the time. If you're not making it better, then it's going the other way. But it's going, whether we like it or not. Just north of us, there was something unusual going on. There was this Cobble Hill Civic Association. And what the hell was a civic association? Italian-Americans are completely and totally family-oriented people. They don't trust government fundamentally, actually. They don't trust civic affairs because that's so closely connected to government. But I'm going to have to do what these Cobble Hill people did. The Cobble Hill Civic Association... By God, I created a Carroll Garden Civic Association. Carroll because of Carroll Park. Gardens because we had these unique front gardens. And before you know it, everybody started referring to this place as Carroll Gardens. We were known as Red Hook. Then they changed the name to Carroll Gardens, and the taxes went up, the price of the homes went up. I don't know, you, you wondered how we survive, I don't know. Guess we don't pay rent, so we just stay here. <laughs> okay. We started with play tech. Play tech used to make baby panties. We used to sell men's woolen underwear. A full slip for a dollar. 
an assortment of girdles with a zipper too, with the long legs, short legs, and long line bras. Do we ever get rid of them all? Oh, we still got one. 38B, that's a good size. We used to sell loads of them. We had that whole section there loaded with them. And you see it's all empty now? That time we had all the Italian ladies, they were hefty. No more now. You go looking in any store, see if you can find something like this. A cobbler apron, they caught it up. You got cobbler aprons? Yes, we still have them. Let's see, we need socks out here. One, two, three. Uh, I've been doing so long. Franklin Delano Roosevelt was president. Hitler was in power. And LaGuardia was the mayor here. I gotta like it to be here that long, I guess. Hi. Hey, Hi. No, All right. That's good. That time we used to sell bike shoe hosiery. You ever hear bike shoe hosiery? Never heard it. Of it. Famous brand, the department store brand now. We got them started in Brooklyn here. We gave them, we gave them a display in the window. People used to come in, how much are they? Dollar thirty-five. Dollar thirty-five for a pair of stockings. They walk out. <laughs> I won't buy them. They were, that time he sold some hosen for about 69 cents a pair, 79. <laughs> All right, goodbye. Watch your step going out. There's a high step there. Wait, wait, wait. Excuse me a minute. Let me see. When that lady came here, she was as, as old as you were. Ah, I guess that's what time does to you. Other wouldn't uh, permit me to talk to any young girl. <laughs> Tell them the stuff, treat them nice, and let them go. Don't start any trouble in the store. I didn't have time to get married. I was too busy here. <laughs> They used to call my mother Marietta. Marietta Farina Guidigo. Farina was a maiden name. You know what, who Farina is? You know the Incredible Hulk? He was uh, my mother's nephew. Don't worry, I won't get uh, the Incredible Hulk after you. <laughs> Today we're having a very slow day. You got, you got a minute? I just want to show you something. This is my proof that we're not lying to you, that we've been here since 1940. Here's our original tax paper. When she, the first sales tax she paid. $12.84. <laughs> that time it was the depression. My father was not making much money, so she decided to open up a store. Boy, dead around here. The whole neighborhood is dead. I worked with my mother when she opened it, and then I uh, joined us, the military, World War II. Me, my brother, two brother-in-law, our whole family was serving the country. I got discharged. I couldn't get a job. Everybody's having a hard time. So I stayed in the store. You know, been selling these for 50 years. It's just the same company, too. But these new customers that are around here, they wouldn't wear these. You can use it for a parachute if you go on an airplane. And the plane's crash. <laughs> you jump out of the airplane. My father and his partner bought this place in 1948. And all the recipes that we have today are the same as they were in 1948. So if you're really looking to eat something from way back when, you got it right here. We try to use all the best flavors and the best ingredients. The idea is to keep them fresh. I don't put any preservatives. Everything you see is, uh, you know, natural. And that's how it's been for 66 years. I'm fast, but my, my father was super fast. Yeah, he was a good baker. You know, he was kind of my idol. 
the, the year that he took the play, I was born in April, he, he took the place in June. So I'm as old as court pastry. I don't know how to explain it, but when you do different things every day, you're, you're probably, like time seems longer. But me, it's like yesterday I started here. It's the same thing, you know? And every day I do the same stuff. I was a little kid. My, my father used to give me a milk box. I used to stand on the milk box and I used to make some cookies. And then when I cooked them, I used to take them home. <laughs> when I was in the eighth grade, I was like 14. I started to sell lemon ice. That was my aim for the summer. So if you want to say that was the time I started to work, you know, not full time, but like every week. The neighborhood was uh, about 90% Italian when I was a little. There was about 12 pastry shops in the area at the time. You know, things changed throughout the years, but you adapt. The older people used to buy volume, used to buy a lot of stuff. One time, it was a holiday, and my father knew, the, knew these people. There was about four or five brothers and sisters. So the first guy comes in to buy something. He buys two dozen pastries. Right? Then the next brother comes in, maybe a half hour or so later. He wants two dozen pastries. And my father said, listen, your brother, your brother was just here. He bought two dozen pastries. Don't buy something else. He said, so what? I got to bring two dozen pastries. That's what I want to bring. And he brought two dozen. So they had four dozen pastries already. And I, I don't know what the other ones brought, but that was... <laughs> No, they don't buy too much. I have the, the box size, you know, the, the most popular size is the small one now. Before it used to be the big one. But I sell a lot of small ones. That's why they call them biscotti. Because they cook twice. Biscotti. Is Gasper here? Oh, these here, the fancy ones. Where's the Italian? Uh, right here, in the front. Right here, some of these. I love these. Dates inside. And the pignoli, where are they? And the layer. Yeah, I like quite a bit of them. What are these here? Those are almond biscotti. Oh? Almond biscotti. I'm in uh, Moscow, hey, they're all the time. You better explain some of these uh, cookies. Uh, uh, I don't know that, but the biscotti I know. And uh, tell them what it's all about, the biscotti. The, the almond bars, uh, what is the model? They call them the salviati, vanilla biscuits, muscandini, the bones of the dead, that's cookies. Bones and, of the dead? Uh, Gee whiz. Is that? That's, uh, <laughs> Marzo candy? Give me one, get some. Here, yeah, one, one, one. This one. is the basil nut, this is the milk. Did you do D'Amico yet? He, uh, they just renovated the store there. Yeah, they're different, D'Amico. I'm um, nostalgic. I try to leave it pretty much the way it was back then, because there's nobody left anymore, like from years ago, you know? We had to change because the area started changing. These young people were, you know, from Wall Street started moving in. There's another new building they built, new stores, many changes. Yeah, this is a new bank. Years ago, we had only one bank there on Atlantic Avenue in Court. Now, I don't know how many banks we've got, probably about eight of them on this Court Street. Must be plenty of money around here. My father, in one of the closets in the apartment, he would cut the board on the floor and put a box underneath, and that was our bank. My father came over approximately 1920. There were very poor people here at that time. We survived, it was rough times, depression times. We lived in a, on Union Street, a small apartment, and it was quite cold. It was tough getting up in the morning. I had to jump up and down. And in the summertime, there was no air conditioning. You know, really hard living.
This is Carroll Park on the left. Where we used to play ball there. It was great. We are young. It's a lot different. The kids now, they send them to all kinds of activity after school. And you got the computers. There was no computers. We had nothing. They do a lot of boxing. Have a circle. And we box with each other. I used to come home. My mother said, oh, she's they're always beating you up. I said, what about the other guy, Ma? Lord, they wanted to choke me. <laughs> I wanted to go to the Navy because my father was in the Navy. My parents, they were a little, uh, you know, hesitant about me joining because of the war. But I volunteered and I went to war, too. It was strange, you know. The only place we used to go to Coney Island, you know. And when I joined the service, I saw more, quite a bit of the world. I got out of service and uh, I couldn't get a job, you know, because all the plants were closed up after the war. This is uh, my mother and father and uh, we were a grocery store. Yeah, many, many moons. My father asked, at that time asked me if I wanted to go into business. He started with coffee and just a few groceries. It wasn't doing that well. I said, no, Pa, I said, we're going to have to make it a supermarket. That time, very few people had cars. People were chopping the mom and pop stores. And we did well, we did well. We had two delivery boys on groceries and all. We made quite a bit of sandwiches. And my brother-in-law was, was extremely fast. I'd be working on one sandwich, he'd finish four. But that was my speed. <laughs> it's me and my father and one of the workers many, many years ago, oh my God. He's about 65 now. So many years, you know, and sometimes they come back, they work for me, quite a number of kids. You know, kids, they're not kids. They, Don't you remember me? And you know, it's just 50 years. You're bored, you get, you know, I don't tell them that, but I mean, you, you know, it's a long time. It's about a little, like, you know, what I say, yeah. Thank you. My father retired. I was alone for a while, and then uh, my son was interested in it. And I gave him the business and uh, my daughter-in-law, they took over. And in the process, we've changed the store about three times. Now it's uh, very uh, appealing to the area. You have to have a type of store that attracts people with higher wages. Now they got dungarees, I think, you know, for 300 bucks, $1,000 for a suit. You know, a working man cannot buy them. But at one time, it uh, was a lot different. I'm afraid that I don't know what to buy for these people now. I'm a little confused. They're nice people, polite. They don't use the same clothing. I don't know what the heck they're wearing. Maybe they're... Wear a grass skirt or something. <laughs> what do you want, a sweatshirt? Well, come, maybe we ought to get some. Hold a sweatshirt with your little hood. Go to see Peterson and you get some. Neighbor change. We were, we're trying to change with it, but. We still get a lot of the old people come around looking for this stuff. That's a whole new ball game now. I'm starting all over again, learning a new way of running a business. Okay, what else we got to do here? We're not doing any business. We want to become movie actors. This is one of our prime front garden blocks. We planted all these trees. These trees were really planted by Josephine Taranto, my first Carroll Gardens Association group. I went to guys I grew up with, played ball with, survived with down here, and I taught them into helping me. We started planting trees, and we started complaining about this filthy Guanas Canal. The stench was up here to Clinton Street. In the summertime, it was unbearable. They identified in the waters of the canal typhoid, 
typhus and a virulent strain of cholera. Cholera! We had cholera in New York City? To make a long story short, we got $458 million to build the Red Hook sewer treatment plant in the Brooklyn Navy Yard, and it got built. I'm going to show you the inside of a typical Italian social club. Not all of them speak English. Take a few minutes and come out. What I, want to, you know, what I want to say, you know, when we came from Italy, everybody from downtown broke. It was easier to come here. People liked sameness, and they came to Carroll Gardens here because they felt comfortable with, with their own kind. This is Carroll, no Carroll God. They came to the radio. Then you became the bay, we changed, you changed the name. We're going to call this spot Carol God. I didn't Stay change the name. Carol God. Well, you made your real estate to go high. Don't give all your wine to this guy over here. Too much wine. Never stop. No, he doesn't need the wine. Okay, He'll uh, do it with the wine or without the wine. Maybe for that. If you want to but there is no doubt in my mind, the only constant in this world is change. It happens all the time. We either go along with the change and change ourselves, or we get left behind. That's why the young yuppies down here, the young urban professionals, call us the leftovers. The leftovers. We're leftover. They think that we're, and in, in a matter of speaking, they're correct. That's why the clubs are so important if we want to hold on to some of our traditions. Well, there's a few that are still left, but most of them left. Most of the people that I grew up with, they're not here anymore. Yeah, yeah they come back, especially for holidays. And matter of fact, they meet, they, they kind of meet here that they didn't see each other for a long time. And you, you got a lot of people, they come over here and they, hey, Joe, how are you? I haven't seen you. You know, and they get a, it's, it's nice over here in the holiday, I tell you. It's nice for them, but I got to work. <laughs> Listen, I used to come here as a school girl and get a lemon ice. And we used to, I used to buy the Anazette and biscuit. <laughs> and every time we came in from Florida, we'd come up here, we'd come in and get my cookies and put them in the car and drive home. <laughs> I got it. Well, I got it. I think a couple of my customers would come look for me if I closed up. <laughs> <laughs> they, they actually told me that. <laughs> they said, you better not close up. <laughs> I don't know what's going to be here in 20 years. I won't be around, but areas change. One time you could buy a house at 25000 in this area. Now they're going for $3 million, $4 million. The rent's at 2000 a month. Can't work for the landlord either. There should be a law that prevents that high-rise uh, rental. Well, we won't have any uh, small stores. I find my life has been very full. I've seen hard times. I've seen service, I've seen good times. My kids don't know nothing about it. They're always coming to college, this and that, you know, they're... But living through the depression, I was happy that I was been through it, you know, so I can appreciate the difference. Different life now, but I keep busy. Remember we ordered the baskets? You brought him to, uh... No, 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 I'm talking I, I love married no, women, you know. No, he delivered the coffee. I, <laughs> and that's about it. And I'm glad my son's here and my daughter-in-law has been very helpful. You didn't recognize them. My vision. I got that old. 
No. Oh, why? Oh, like 87. Well, you're older than me. 86. Yeah, you look older. How long have you known each other? Too long. There's a cross street right here. That's Brooklyn. <laughs> Two great guys. To me, uh, it's my great life. I don't know what the hell. Say two. Why? I gotta do that. No. You can no. do it next time. Want me to do a tap dance? <laughs> <laughs> but my brother-in-law, who married my sister, was my Korean buddy. We promised each other that whoever got home first would visit that person's family. By the time I got finished with the army, he got home before I did. Met my sister and married her. Where's your father? Did he? Yeah, he's been here now. You come back? There's nothing to come back to. We got Coney Island. <laughs> no, uh, well, I don't know. I'm getting a big kick out of it. This is better than getting married. <laughs> oh, how much longer, young ladies, are we going to be here? I don't know how much more I can take. <laughs>